Welcome to our worship at First Christian Church for December the 19th and December the 20th. With me in the sanctuary today uh, are Pastor Sarju Jackson, Ron Beach, and Josh Beach, and I am Associate Pastor Leanne DeTarnubert. We welcome you here today, and we really thank you, all the guests, for joining us to worship as we approach the day we celebrate that our Christ was born. I do have uh, a brief announcement to make. You will notice that uh, Pastor Rick is not in the pulpit today and was not last week. We are grieving that he has had to step down from the ministry because of health reasons. And we all pray together for his speedy recovery. And we give thanks for those who can step in in his stead. You'll see on your screen some Zoom links for Bible studies if you'd like to join us in study. Or if you would like to join us to pray, call the number on the Zoom link uh, that's on your screen right now. And if you would care to give, that link also is appearing on your screen right now. And we most gratefully accept your gifts. We're in the hanging of the greens season, and this week we're in week four, the holly and the ivy. This is the fourth week of Advent. And Mary bore sweet Jesus Christ on Christmas Day in the morning. The line is from the car, carol, the holly and the ivy. The fourth hanging of the green symbol is the holly and the ivy. They are evergreen as are the other symbols of the tree and the wreath. Looking at the holly, the sharpness of the leaves recall the crown of thorns. The red berries in the center represent Jesus' blood that was shed for our salvation. The ivy represents the Virgin Mary. As the carol continues, Mary bore sweet Jesus to be our savior, for to redeem us all and for to do us sinners good. From our Advent devotional, we have the week four reading, and you may join with me in reading as I read from page 45. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent and we light the candle of joy. We are reminded that joy can be present in the midst of the uncertainties for joy comes from the fullness of God's presence among us given through the one we call Jesus, the Christ. Mary, his mother, responded from a heart full of joy when she learned she would be the mother of Jesus. This is reflected in our scripture for today from Luke 1, beginning in verse 46. My soul is ecstatic, overflowing with praises to God. My spirit bursts with joy over my life-giving God and Savior. For he set his tender gaze upon me, his lowly servant girl. And from here on, everyone will know that I have been favored and blessed 
the mighty one has worked a mighty miracle for me. Holy is his name. Mercy kisses all his godly loves from one generation to the next. Mighty power flows from him to scatter all those who walk in pride. Powerful princes, he tears from their thrones and he lifts up the lowly to take their place. Those who hunger for him will always be filled. But the smug and self-satisfied he will send away empty. Because he can never forget to show mercy. He has helped his chosen servant Israel, keeping his promises to Abraham and to his descendants forever. That's Mary's song of praise. And like Mary, we rejoice in what God has done, how God has provided the justice that comes when love brings a smile to our face despite circumstances. Joy, joy, God's great joy. Let us light this candle. May its light cast out darkness, reminding us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Joy is an expression. Joy is an expression of peace. And peace is the recognition of the presence of God. I light this candle this morning expressing joy, recognizing that God is here. Let's pray. We open our hearts to receive from you, O Holy One, the peace that passes all understanding and the fullness of joy that cannot be taken away from us. May your spirit and the love you gave through Jesus continue to fill our cups to overflowing with joy now and always. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. After the sermon, we will have communion. You are all welcome to take communion from home using an element for bread and an element for the cup, right at home. We welcome you to join us. We are disciples of Christ, of movement for wholeness in a fragmented world as part of the one body of Christ. We welcome all to the Lord's table as God in Christ has welcomed us. Let us now prepare our hearts to be before the throne of God as we listen to Ross Wolf.
Thank you, Ross, for preparing our hearts into this time of pastoral prayer. As we finish recording last Saturday, the message for last Sunday, and as I watched the service last Sunday, I began to think more and more about peace and the Advent candle of peace. I spent a portion of my time thinking of peace, especially what Micah 5, 2 to 5 has to say. Micah said that we shall live secure because we are fed by the one of peace. We have peace because we recognize the presence of the one who gives peace. We shall be saved because we acknowledge the shiny face of God. Let us pray. God of peace, here we are before you once again. Give us peace and joy. For joy is our way of expressing peace. And peace is our way of recognizing your shining face. Bring your people together in joy as we worship you. Touch each heart this morning. Take away the pain of sorrow and restore comfort. Take away the spirit of doubt and restore the spirit of love. Take away the spirit of greed and restore the spirit of humility. Take away the spirit of selfishness and restore the spirit of authentic acceptance. Too many times, God, we think we can do it without you. But your word said we should trust in you and lean not on our own understanding. And if we acknowledge you, you will direct our path. I pray for our members who are having health issues this morning. God, there are quite a few of them on our list this morning. I pray for them. I pray for your healing hands and your healing spirit to touch them this morning. 
I pray for our members who are having financial issues. And yes, we may not know that, Lord, but there are some of our members who may be having financial issues. But not only our members, Lord, there are quite a lot of people who are having financial issues. God, some of them have lost their jobs. And some of them are about to be evicted. I pray to you, O God, that you give them that which they are looking for right now. Restore to them, God, your glory. I pray for the ones who are having family issues. I pray that you restore lasting peace within their family. I thank you this morning, Lord, for our nation and for everything that is happening in our nation. I thank you, God, for the development and God for the pronouncement that there is a vaccine to help slow down the spread of a pandemic that has taken over the lives of too many people. I pray to you, God, that we too would do a little part and that help a little bit. Do our portion, God, to follow what our leaders are asking of us. Thank you, God. I pray to you, God, and thank you. For with you is the fountain of life, and your light do shine, and we will see your light and your glory. God, we pray all of these prayers this morning, just also as you have taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy way be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. Lead us not, Lord, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm very humble this morning and very pleased to introduce to you all Cherise Benton and Friend for a special music. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song of old. From angels bending near the earth to touch their harps of gold. Peace on the earth and goodwill to all from heaven's gracious King. The world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing. Still through the cloven skies they come with peaceful wings unfurled. And still their heavenly music flows all over the weary world. Above its sad and lonely plains, they bend on hovering wing. And ever o'er its babel sounds, the blessed angels sing. And you beneath life's crushing load, whose forms are bending low. Who toil along the climbing ways with painful steps and slow. Look now for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing. Oh, rest beside the weary road and hear the angels sing. For lo, 
the days I'll hasten on by prophet seen of old when with the ever circling years shall come the time foretold when peace shall over all the earth its ancient splendors flee and the whole world send back the song which now the angels sings. How many of you grew up listening to J. Vernon McGee and his radio show called Through the Bible. Did you get on the radio bus or the Bible bus for that four years as he went through the Bible over and over and over again? At the opening of each radio broadcast, the words to this hymn was, were sung. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say to you than he has said? To you who for Jesus, who for refuge to Jesus have fled. This hymn always caught my attention because of the strong male acapallo uh, voices and the harmony. But the first two lines were my hook. A firm foundation is laid in the Bible and what more can God say than what God has already said? That's where we will start today with our song of Mary in Luke. You've all heard many sermons, I imagine, on the dire social situation that a pregnancy during her engagement would have had in that culture for this young teenage girl. We know actually little of Mary before she received this important acknowledgement from God, but her response to the entire astonishing situation tells us much about her past. Mary must have been immersed in the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, at Elizabeth's joyful confirmation that Mary was carrying the Lord of Lords. She responded with a spontaneous song, the scripture we read today, that is made up of passages of six different Psalms. Mary knew the scripture so thoroughly that she expressed her joy by reciting them. She knew Israel's story, and she knew the promises that were to come. The passage says that Elizabeth was speaking out of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, but apparently Mary was speaking out of her solid knowledge and firm foundation of scripture. She was steadfastly grounded in the scripture, they were her bedrock that allowed this awkward social circumstance to be viewed from a servant's perspective, willing and able, even if not understanding what was being asked of her. I recently read a, this statement in my devotional. The Christian life is hard work. Not the Christian life is full of hard works, but the Christian life is hard work. What? Aren't we transformed in the moment that we believe in Jesus as our Savior, a completely new creature in Christ? What about being this transformed creature?
preacher re involves hard work of a Christian life. I think we can find some answers from both Jesus and James. Matthew records Jesus as saying, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, the word of God, and does them, I will liken him to the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Hearing and doing has something to do with building. And most building is hard work. Jesus was explaining that we must build the word, uh, words of God into our lives in a systematic, planned way. Our transformation, when we come to believe in Jesus, allows us to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear spiritual truth. Truth by truth, we build our foundation for spiritual growth and maturity. Well, how does this happen? How do we actually build that firm foundation, one like Mary had? James puts it this way in his letter. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a person who looks at his face in the mirror and then, after looking, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. <clears throat> now, I will be the first to admit that I have listened to some sermons and then have not been able to recall what was in them by lunchtime. Um, anybody else with that confession? We have the distinct advantage of being able to listen to the word being read or preached on our phones, on our televisions, on our radios, on our computers. Just about anywhere we can hear the word of God. I would say we have no lack of biblical resources and really no excuse for not hearing what it says. Hear and do, says Jesus. Listen and do, says James. I believe Mary still teaches us how to do this in our age. How do we live this life like Mary? A life of humility, obedience, belief, and submission to God. Well, first, we just have to pay attention. Every word of God we hear has a purpose. In Isaiah 55, 10, it says, As the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me in but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. It was sent for a purpose. James cautions, cautions us not to engage in self-deception de about our obedience to God's word by just dutifully listening as if you were not encountering something very, very important. There is nothing more important in your life than to contend with the word of God and thus contend with its author. His word penetrates our mind, our soul, our spirit. So even our thoughts will know when the spirit is speaking to us. As you listen to or read scripture, ask the Holy Spirit, am I doing that? What does my life look like compared to this passage? Am I called to a new obedience or belief? Is disbelief or sin in my life being pointed out? Well, second, if your evaluation finds you a little short on obedience, spend some time 
in prayerful thinking about what needs to be changed and why. Write something down that acknowledges that you realized this during your self-examination to make yourself accountable, even to yourself. God promises to guide you in the paths of righteousness. Remember, we read in Psalm 23, lead us in the paths of righteousness for his namesake, for the reputation of God's name. Righteousness means right living. That written statement that you, that you put down may take the form of a confession to God. Remember, knowing about God requires, what God requires, and doing it is not the same thing. For the record, there are very few scriptures that do not require some new obedience on my part. Most of us can recite all kinds of verses about how to live, but we may not be doing them ourselves. Satan himself quoted scripture to Jesus. Perhaps what we need is a recommitment to an obedient spirit. This kind of holy self-examination should not take long for most of us. We know very well where we are disobedient. I remember when I was a young girl, a young teenager, I babysat for a nearby farm family. Now there were two little girls, India Lee and Kathy. India Lee, the older daughter, was sweet and compliant, but Kathy, Kathy was a challenge. She pushed every limit. Once, when I caught her obviously lying, something like this, no, I am not holding a candy bar. I asked her, why, Kathy, have you lied? She staunchly claimed, I only lie when I have to. I have never forgotten that excuse for lying. Perhaps it's a more honest way of expressing our disobedience. I'm only disobedient to God when I want to be. Said out loud, it does ring hollow, doesn't it? Well, next, we focus on one thing that has penetrated your heart and soul. It's likely something that the Holy Spirit was trying to get your attention about anyway. Commit prayerfully to asking God to point out opportunities to start this transformation. You'll discover that the Holy Spirit will start bringing to mind your obedience whenever you encounter that situation. Your foundation is laid when you exercise your will to bring it in line with what you know the Lord wants you to do. This requires repetition, probably some gritting of teeth at first, and some wrestling with God, and perseverance until you finally become more like Jesus in this, and voila, a stone is laid in your foundation. How can you tell what kind of foundation a life has been built on? Watch and see what happens when a storm comes. A life built on the word of God will withstand the very storm that sweeps away the life that does not heed God's word. Our church family is now in a time of storm. I'm encouraged by the firm foundation we have had in the faithful lives of those who have led in the past and who are leading now. Your lives of allowing the spirit to permeate your thoughts and actions are revealed in the calm and trusting demeanor you demonstrate now as we move forward from our sudden loss. It does not mean a lack of love or concern for the one we care about. It means we have trusted God in the past. God has answered our prayers in the past and God will continue to answer prayers. 
we can depend on his promised firm foundation. That firm foundation is built on God's love and God's desire for our best lives. Well, the, res the result of this hard life of spiritual work can be summarized, I think, by Paul's spontaneous statement of praise in Ephesians 3. Why do we do this hard work? Paul tells us, And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you. And the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. Then you'll be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences. The great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Never doubt God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes you. This is the foundation of joy that Mary felt, expressed so beautifully in her song. This trust allowed her to trust in what the Lord was doing in her life in spite of its tough cultural implications. It is the joy that you can have too. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, poured into your firm foundation. Hear and do. Amen. As we prepare our hearts to meet here at the table and take communion with the Lord, Ron will play O Little Town of Bethlehem.
Thank you again, Ron, once again for uh, playing that beautiful music for us as we prepare our hearts this morning to receive the Lord's Supper. Scripture tells us, For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In these few verses read, the central motif in this verse is remembrance. And as within the Jewish context, remembrance is always a big thing. So for me this morning, as I think about remembrance, I remember the joy that God has brought into my life. So please join me this morning with whatever you have as a bread or a cup. And let us celebrate together this morning. Let us pray. God, we thank you this morning for your body and your blood that was broken and spilled on our behalf. We remember you, God. And we remember you that we are experiencing joy because of what you have done for us. Thank you so much. We bless you and thank you for everything. Amen. Let us partake together. Let us now receive our going out prayer. God, we thank you for the service this morning. Thank you for your presence in this service. Thank you for the words that you place on our hearts that we were able to share with our fellow uh, members this morning and friends. We thank you for uh, Leanne and the message that you gave her uh, to us this morning, that we can rely on the foundation, God, that has been created with your spirit. Thank you, God, for everything that this church is going through because, Lord, we know that in it all, your good will be fulfilled. We know that in it all, you are working for your glory, not our glory, but for your glory. So we bless you this morning just as you have blessed us. We bless our members this morning just as they have blessed us. God, May we use this week to reflect on the joy that you have brought into this world. We pray this prayer to you this morning. God, now may the peace that you have given us, the joy that you have given us, go with us throughout this week. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. One final announcement. Please join us on Christmas Eve for our Christmas Eve worship service. Thank you. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive. King, let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature.
nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. Let men their songs employ. While fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains, repeat the sounding joy, repeat the sounding joy, repeat, repeat the sounding joy. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow as far as curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as, far as the curse is found. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders and wonders of his love.